It's Wednesday, October 12th. Drawers in Connecticut order conspiracy theorist Alec Jones to pay nearly $1 billion to Sandy Hook Elementary School shooting victims' relatives and an FBI agent who said Jones turned their loss and trauma into years of torment by promoting the lie that the rampage was a hoax. The $965 million verdict is the second big judgment against the InfoWars host for spreading the myth that the deadliest school shooting in U.S. history never happened. It could bankrupt the companies where Jones has stashed tens of millions of dollars. The U.N. General Assembly votes overwhelmingly to condemn Russia's attempted illegal annexation of four Ukrainian regions and demands that Moscow immediately reverse its actions. The international community soundly rejected the affront to territorial integrity, to national sovereignty, to peace and security. And today's vote has a practical effect. It means that in the eyes of the world and the United Nations, Ukraine's borders remain the same. The vote in the 193-member world body, 143 to 5, with 35 abstentions. The Los Angeles City Council member whose racist slurs in a leaked recording created an uproar resigns today, hours after the state attorney general announces an investigation into possible criminal charges. Former Council President Nuri Martinez, the first Latina to hold the seat, announces her decision after a groundswell of outrage and calls for the resignation of her and two other council members. Just four weeks to go to the midterm elections and the race to control the United States Senate appears to be a toss-up. And the House Committee investigating last year's attack on the U.S. Capitol will convene tomorrow for what could be its final public hearing, promising to delve into former President Trump's state of mind during the violent insurrection. From Pacifica Radio, KPFA in Berkeley, KPFK in Los Angeles, this is the Evening News. I'm Mark Miracle. A Connecticut jury today ordered InfoWars host and conspiracy theorist Alex Jones to pay $965 million to the families of victims of the Sandy Hook school massacre for making false claims that the 2012 school shooting was a hoax. The verdict is the second big judgment against Jones. He has continuously said the massacre never happened and that the grieving families seen in news coverage were so-called crisis actors hired as part of a plot to take away people's guns. Robbie Parker is the father of one of the child victims, six-year-old Amelie, one of the 20 children and six adult staffers killed at Sandy Hook. He said the trial exposed Jones for what he is. Every day in that courtroom, we got up on the stand and we told the truth. Everybody that took the stand told the truth except for one. The award came in a lawsuit filed by the relatives of five children and three educators killed in the mass shooting, plus an FBI agent who was among the first responders to the scene. A jury in Texas back in August awarded nearly $50 million to the parents of another slain child. Jones's lies prompted some of his followers to harass and threaten victims' family members. Strangers showed up at their homes to record them. People hurled abusive comments on social media. Testifying during the trial, Jones acknowledged that he had been wrong about Sandy Hook. He said the shooting was real, but both in the courtroom and on his show, he's been defiant. He called the trial an affront 
to free speech. Jones now faces a third trial back in Texas again around the end of the year in a lawsuit filed by the parents of another child killed in the shooting. It's unclear how much of the verdict Jones can afford to pay. During the trial in Texas, he testified he couldn't afford any judgment over two million bucks. Free Speech Systems has filed for bankruptcy protection, but an economist testified in that Texas proceeding that Jones and his company were worth as much as $270 million. Juror deliberations began in Florida today to decide whether Florida school shooter Nicholas Cruz is sentenced to death or to life without parole for the 2018 mass shooting of 17 people at Parkland's Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School. For them to recommend a death sentence, they must unanimously agree. Prosecutor Mike Satz argued for the death penalty in his closing arguments. He picked Valentine's Day to do it while school was in session. And you could tell by the evidence and the testimony you've been sitting here and listening to everything, this plan was goal-directed, it was calculated, it was purposeful, and it was a systematic massacre. Nicholas Cruz's attorneys argued that his birth mother's excessive drinking while pregnant left him with brain damage that put him on the path to murder, and they pled for a life sentence. Reporter Gabriel Fami. Nicholas Cruz has already pleaded guilty to the 17 counts of first-degree murder. Now the jury's job is to decide if he should get life in prison or the death penalty. Prosecutors have argued that when Cruz, who was 19 at the time, went to his former school to carry out what's the deadliest high school shooting in U.S. history, it was a cold and calculated act. His defense lawyers said Cruz was mentally ill and brain damaged as a result of his mother using drugs and alcohol when she was pregnant. She asked the jury to show mercy, even though she admitted he did not have any for his victims. Gabrielle Fami reporting. The Los Angeles City Council member whose racist slurs and a leaked recording created an uproar resigned today, hours after the state attorney general announced an investigation into possible criminal charges involving a meeting where she made the remarks. Former council member Nuri Martinez the first Latina to hold the seat as president, announced her decision in a press release following a groundswell of outrage and calls for the resignations from the council of her and two other council members involved in the conversation recorded last year. In that conversation, she made racist remarks about the black son of a white councilman and other crude comments. Her announcement came after State Attorney General Rob Bonta said he would investigate Los Angeles's redistricting process that the three council members were discussing with the leader of the county AFL-CIO, in which they schemed to protect Latino political strength in council districts. Bonta, a Democrat, like the three council members, said the investigation could lead to civil liability or to criminal charges, depending on what is found. Three council members, Martinez, Kevin de Leon, and Gil Cedillo, faced calls from President Joe Biden and others to resign after the recording surfaced online. Antonia Gonzalez has more. Native American Council Member Mitch O'Farrell is among those calling for the resignation. He spoke out against the remarks during a press conference Monday. This is a heavy and a deeply tragic moment for this city. The court of public opinion has rendered a verdict, and the verdict is they all must resign. O'Farrell reiterated his view on the scandal during a council meeting Tuesday, which included protests from the public. A group of elected officials that engaged in racism against an African-American child that engaged in horrific things said about indigenous peoples from Oaxaca that, that alluded to some of the old tropes against the LGBTQ community. I don't see how that presence continuing in city leadership 
is going to allow the city to move forward, to heal, to move past this, to reconcile. O'Farrell says their presence on the council will continue to be an obstacle. The controversy comes as President Biden is set to visit Los Angeles this week on a trip that was reportedly already planned. The conversation is said to be from last October when the council members were discussing redistricting. All three have reportedly apologized. And that's Antonia Gonzalez reporting. A judge has ruled that former President Donald Trump will have to sit for a deposition next week in a defamation lawsuit filed by a writer who claims he raped her in the mid-1990s. U.S. District Judge Lewis Kaplan rejected a request from Trump's lawyers that the planned testimony be delayed. The deposition is now scheduled for October 19th. Writer E. Jean Carroll says Trump raped her in an upscale Manhattan department store's dressing room. Trump has denied it. Carroll's lawsuit claims that Trump then damaged her reputation in 2019 when he denied raping her publicly. Trump's legal team has been trying to squash the suit by arguing that the Republican was just doing his job as president when he denied the allegations. That's a key question because if Trump was acting within the scope of his duties as a federal employee, the U.S. government would become the defendant in the case. The Second U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals said in a split decision last month that Trump was a federal employee when he commented on Carroll's claims but asked another court in Washington to decide whether Trump's public statements occurred during the scope of his employment. Judge Kaplan said Trump's repeatedly tried to delay the collection of evidence in the lawsuit since 2019. The Biden administration is urging the Supreme Court to steer clear of a legal fight over classified documents seized during an FBI search of former President Trump's Florida estate. The high court is weighing an emergency appeal from Trump, asking it to overturn a lower court ruling and permit an independent arbiter or special master to review the roughly 100 documents with classified markings that were taken during the August 8th search of Mar-a-Lago. The Justice Department says in a 32-page filing yesterday that Trump's claim has no merit, noting that the case involves extraordinarily sensitive government records. The House committee investigating last year's attack on the U.S. Capitol will assemble tomorrow for what could be its final public hearing, at least before the midterms, promising to delve into former President Trump's state of mind and a presentation designed to tie up a host of loose ends before the panel dissolves at the end of the year. Sources say the select committee is expected to treat the hearing as a closing argument ahead of the November midterms, which will seek to hammer home that former President Trump remains a clear and present danger to U.S. democracy, particularly in the context of the upcoming 2024 presidential election. No witnesses are scheduled to appear in person tomorrow. The hearing is to feature new testimony and evidence that the committee has uncovered since its last meeting in July. The committee since then has interviewed more former members of Trump's cabinet, received more than a million communications from the Secret Service from the lead-up to the insurrection, and has sat down with Jenny Thomas, the wife of Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas. You can hear live coverage, gavel-to-gavel, of the hearing on this Pacifica radio station, hosted by Mitch Jesuit of the Letters and Politics program. It begins at 10 a.m. tomorrow, Pacific Coast time. A member of the Oath Keepers who traveled to Washington before the January 6th attack testified today about a massive cache of weapons the far-right extremist group stashed in a Virginia hotel room. Taking the stand in the seditious conspiracy case against Oath Keepers founder Stuart Rhodes and four associates, Terry Cummings showed jurors an AR-15 firearm and an orange box for ammunition that he contributed 
to the so-called quick reaction force that the Oath Keepers had staged at the hotel outside of Washington in case they needed weapons on January 6th. I had not seen that many weapons in one location since I was in the military, said Cummings, a veteran who joined the Oath Keepers in Florida in 2020. Prosecutors have said teams of Oath Keepers guarded the arsenal of firearms and were prepared to rush them into the hands of extremists at the Capitol if needed. The alleged teams and cache of weapons are a central piece of the Department of Justice's case against Rhodes and the four associates charged with seditious conspiracy in the January 6th attack. Authorities have alleged the teams and the stockpile of arms were designed to get weapons into Oath Keepers' hands quickly if they were needed to support a plot to stop the transfer of power from Republican Donald Trump to Democrat Joe Biden on January 6th. Defense lawyers have said the Oath Keepers often set up quick reaction forces for events, but insist they were defensive forces only to be used to protect against violence from Antifa activists or in the event Trump invoked the Insurrection Act, which supposedly would have authorized militias to defend the country. Cummings' testimony came in the second week of the trial. It's expected to last several weeks. You're listening to the Evening News on KPFA in Berkeley, KPFK in Los Angeles, KFCF in Fresno, online at kpfa.org. The United Nations General Assembly today voted to reject Russia's purported annexation of four territories it occupies in Ukraine. The world body, by an overwhelming majority, approved a resolution urging nations not to recognize Russia's so-called annexation, and calling on Russia to immediately reverse its annexation declaration. Christopher Martinez filed this report. The results of the vote is as follows. In favor, 143, against 5, abstentions, 35. With that vote, the United Nations General Assembly passed its fourth resolution on the war since the start of Russia's full-scale invasion, and it's the strongest one to date. It condemns Russia's so-called referendums in eastern Ukraine. It urges nations not to recognize Russia's purported annexations of four provinces, and it calls for Russia to roll back its declaration of annexation and recognize Ukraine's territorial integrity. U.S. Ambassador Linda Thomas-Greenfield spoke during debate on the resolution, saying it protects us all. Today it's Russia invading Ukraine, but tomorrow it could be another nation's whose territory is violated. It could be you. You could be next. What would you expect from this chamber? Our message is loud and clear. It does not matter if you as a nation are big or small, rich or poor, old or new. If you are a UN member state, your borders are your own and are protected by international law. They cannot be redrawn by anyone else by force. The General Assembly took up the resolution after Russia vetoed a similar measure in the Security Council. In the General Assembly, Russia had unsuccessfully pushed for a secret vote instead of an open roll call vote. So when the final tally came, it showed only four other countries joining Russia's opposition, namely Belarus, North Korea, Syria, and Nicaragua. The 35 abstainers included China, India, Pakistan, and South Africa. Russian Ambassador Vasily Nebenzia blasted what he calls the anti-Russia draft resolution, saying it would destroy any efforts at a diplomatic solution. He describes it as simply chock full of these ugly double standards imposed by the West. Today's draft selectively cites the declarations of principle governing relations between states of 1970. Not a word is said about the rights of peoples to self-determinations which paved the way for decolonization and made it possible for many states present in this hall today to gain a seat in the General Assembly. Today, they are trying to make you forget that the West opposed this process with all its might while the, United, while the Soviet Union contributed to it. Unlike the Security Council actions, the General Assembly resolution is not legally binding, although it does send a strong message of international condemnation for Russia's war. 
The most telling action now is taking place on the battlefield. As the UN General Assembly was debating the resolution, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky met with World Bank, IMF, and U.S. Treasury officials, where he called for a stronger collaboration. This is the true defense, our joint defense of our shared democracy, our mode of, li of life. Terror has to lose, has to lose. Ukraine has to win. And that's absolutely real with your support. Once again, thank you all those who uh, help us. Uh, glory to Ukraine. Ukrainian Prime Minister Denis Shmihal is calling on the world to ramp up sanctions on Russia as part of what he calls our battle for global freedom. In Brussels, U.S. military leaders met with the Ukraine Defense Contract Group, about 50 nations coordinating aid to Ukraine, where they talked about providing new air defense systems. General Mark Milley is chair of the U.S. Joint Chiefs of Staff. Ukraine is not asking for soldiers from any other country. The Ukrainians are willing to fight for themselves. All they ask for is the means to do it. And as President Biden has said and many other national leaders have said, we will do as much as we can for as long as we can, and we will do as much as it takes for as long as it takes. Lloyd Austin is the U.S. Secretary of Defense. But Russia's atrocities have further united the nations of goodwill that stand with Ukraine. So we are here because rules matter, because rights matter, and because sovereignty matters. And in the past few days, Putin has given us all another grim preview of a future in which the appetites of aggressive autocrats outweigh the rights of peaceful states. At that news conference, Ukrainian reporter Volodymyr Runets asked a question that he said was not his own, but rather a question that people in Ukraine are asking. When will they be able to just sleep well and not be afraid to leave their families behind and go on a trip like this? Because I'm really, I'm, I'm here and I'm really um, anxious about what is happening to my family back home. So when are the systems going to be provided and is there a possibility that the sky is going to be safe? Reporting for Pacifica Radio News KPFA, I'm Christopher Martinez. Russia's top KGB successor agency said today that it's arrested eight people on charges of involvement in the attack on the bridge linking Russia to Crimea. The Federal Security Service, the FSB, said it arrested five Russians and three citizens of Ukraine and Armenia on charges of involvement in Saturday's attack on the bridge. A truck loaded with explosives appeared to blow up while driving across the bridge, killing four and causing two sections of one of the two automobile links to collapse. The FSB charged that the arrested suspects were working on orders of Ukraine's military intelligence to secretly move the explosives into Russia and forge the accompanying documents. It said the explosives were moved by sea from the Ukrainian port of Odessa to Bulgaria before being shipped to Georgia, driven to Armenia, and then back to Georgia before being transported to Russia in a complex scene scheme to secretly deliver them to the target. Russian President Vladimir Putin denounced the attack on the bridge as an act of terrorism and responded by ordering a barrage of missile strikes on Ukraine. There are continued attempts to carry out terrorist attacks on our territory. Russia's responses will be harsh, and their scale will correspond to the level of threat created for the Russian Federation. No one should have any doubt about that. Translation by the Al Jazeera news agency. Ukrainian officials have lauded the explosion on the bridge, but stopped short of directly claiming responsibility for it. Ukraine's presidential office says Russia's shelling in the past 24 hours has affected eight regions in the southeast, while strikes on central and western areas have eased for the moment after the intense shelling of the last two days. According to the presidential office's morning update, Russian forces used drones, heavy artillery, and missiles. The report said three people were rescued alive from the rubble in Zaporizhia 
after over a dozen missiles rained down on the city. The report said a six-year-old girl and two more people were wounded in the shelling of Nicopol, where the attacks damaged some three dozen residential buildings, private houses, kindergartens, a school, two plants, and several shops. Ukrainian forces say they shot down nine Iranian Sahed-136 drones and destroyed eight caliber cruise missiles near Mykolaiv, leaving the southern city without power. Ukrainian authorities say a Russian attack on a market in the eastern Donetsk region killed seven people and wounded eight. Ukrainian officials and military analysts say Kiev's counteroffensive in the occupied regions in the south and the east of Ukraine has slowed down significantly despite Ukraine's retaking five towns and villages in the Kherson region. Russian troops have been reinforcing the front lines and regrouping following earlier Ukrainian successes, which has forced the Ukrainian forces to ease their advances. The Zaporizhia Ukrainian nuclear power plant that's been surrounded by Russian forces lost power this morning when a Russian missile damaged a distant electrical substation, increasing the risk of radiation disaster. The International Atomic Energy Agency said the power to Zaporizhia nuclear power plant was restored about eight hours later. But experts say the outage, the second one in five days, shows just how precarious the situation at Europe's largest nuclear power plant is. They say repeated power outages over short periods of time are only making the problem worse. Some European countries are trying to prepare for the worst and started stockpiling iodine tablets to help protect their populations from possible radioactive fallout. Two Democrats have introduced a bicameral bill to block U.S. arms sales to Saudi Arabia in response to its efforts to cut back oil production to artificially boost oil prices The critics say will help Russia finance its war in Ukraine. California Congressman Ro Khanna and Connecticut Senator Richard Blumenthal introduced the bill. The Saudis' actions aid and abet a murderous and brutal criminal invasion by Russia. They endanger the world economy, and they threaten higher gas prices for Americans at the pump. But it's more than oil that is at stake here. It's also human rights abuses, butchering journalists, fostering civil war in Yemen, failing to respect our 9-11 9-11 victims in this country. Senator Blumenthal also called it an issue of national security, noting the U.S. is providing military assistance to a country that is now aligned with what he calls Russia's war crimes in Ukraine. Because we are selling highly sensitive, advanced technology to a country that has aligned itself with an adversary, Russia, that is committing terrorist war crimes in Ukraine. And so there's a moral imperative, but also a national security imperative. Speaking to reporters before leaving for Colorado today, President Biden pledged to take action in consultation with lawmakers when they return to Capitol Hill next month. Israel has followed the lead of Western nations in condemning Russia's annexation of the four Ukrainian provinces. Israel's stance led a leading liberal Israeli newspaper columnist to accuse Israeli leaders of hypocrisy and to write that there is no fundamental difference between tearing Ukraine into shreds and tearing Palestine into shreds. For their part, Palestinian leaders have maintained silence on the issue. Rami Al-Megari reports from Gaza. Israel's foreign ministry said in a brief statement that it supports the sovereignty and territorial integrity of Ukraine and would not support Russia's annexation of four provinces. It might seem the perfect opportunity for Palestinian leaders to denounce Israeli hypocrisy 
Israel itself has annexed large portions of the occupied Palestinian West Bank in violation of international law. But Palestinian leaders have remained silent on the Russian annexation and the overall war in Ukraine. A senior Hamas leader in Gaza, Ismail Rodwan, declined to speak about the war. He said Hamas recently sent a delegation to the Russian capital and that Russia has an important role to play in helping the Palestinians. Russia's role is significant amid the total support of the U.S. and other Western nations for the Zionist occupation. The unipolar domination of the world led by the United States must come to an end. Following the meetings in Moscow, relations were normalized between Hamas and Syria, which is Russia's regional ally. Those ties were broken in the aftermath of the Syrian popular uprising in 2011. Representatives of the rival ruling Fatih Party of Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas in the West Bank city of Ramallah and in Gaza failed to respond to Pacifica's repeated requests for an interview on Russia's annexation. The head of the Gaza-based Palestinian Board for the Defense of Palestinian People's Rights, Dr. Salah Abdul Ati, said, There is no advantage to Palestinians for their leaders to take sides in the conflict. The Palestinian position is a general stance that is based on values as stated by the United Nations. I see that Palestinians have no interest whatsoever by expressing a position towards the parties involved in this conflict. Abdul Ati said that Palestinians demand an end to the current double standard in applying international law. Unlike their Palestinian leaders, Young people Pacifica talked to in Gaza were willing to discuss the annexation and draw the connections to their own situation. 19-year-old Faris Khalaf says he opposes Russia's actions in Ukraine. We would never support such an annexation, but as the world now defends human rights, we would ask the whole world what human rights respect you have shown to our own Palestinian rights. 24-year-old Maryam has much the same view of Russia's actions and Israel's. It is totally unfair that a country annexes part of another country. In the meantime, we are very concerned that while the world condemns this and supports the Ukrainian people, they neglect us Palestinians. It's a complete injustice. Gidon Levy is a veteran columnist for the Israeli publication Haaretz. He said Israel's condemnation of Russia's annexation gave irony and hypocrisy a bad name. Levy said if the war continues, Israel might have to join in the sanctions against Russia, which it has to this point avoided. He concluded that, quote, that will be the day Israeli boycott, divestment and sanctions against Russia, much less moral than the original. It won't keep it from screaming that BDS is anti-Semitic and seeks to destroy Israel. Sanctions are appropriate then as long as they are imposed on Iran and Russia, not on Israel. Save us, Levy wrote. For Pacifica Radio, KPFA, I am Rami al Mirari in Gaza. And you're listening to the Evening News on KPFA in Berkeley, KPFK in Los Angeles, KFCF in Fresno. Online at kpfa.org, it's an hour-long newscast that airs each night at 6. Protests swept across at least 19 cities in Iran today, sparked by the death of a 22-year-old woman detained last month by the country's morality police, even as security forces targeted demonstrators in the streets. The protests over the death of Masa Amini have become one of the greatest challenges to Iran's theocracy since the country's 2009 Green Movement. Demonstrators have included oil workers, high school students, and women marching without their mandatory headscarf or hijab. Witnesses said and videos showed that calls for protests beginning at noon today saw a massive deployment of riot police and plainclothes officers throughout the capital, Tehran, and other cities. Witnesses also described disruptions affecting their mobile Internet services. NetBlocks, an advocacy group, said that Iran's Internet traffic had dropped some 25 percent 
compared to the peak, even during a working day in which students were in class across the country. Iran's government insists Amini was not mistreated in custody, but her family says her body showed bruises and other signs of beating after she was detained for violating the Islamic Republic's strict dress code. Last Friday, three weeks after Masa's death, the Iranian Legal Medicine Organization announced that her death was not caused by blows to the head and limbs, but by multiple organ failure caused by cerebral hypoxia. It did not say whether she had suffered any injuries. The report said she fell while in custody due to underlying diseases. Amjad Amini, Masha's father. I don't know how they come up with these lies. I reject them all. My daughter was beaten, and that's the reason she died. This is what one of the specialists publicly said. He said she was beaten. If the officials were right, why didn't they let me see Masa's body for the last time before the burial? Anger has been particularly acute in western Iran's Kurdish regions, as Amini was Kurdish. Today, a Kurdish group called the Henga Organization for Human Rights showed images of closed shops and empty streets in some areas, describing it as a strike by shopkeepers. The group also posted a video it said came from Amini's hometown of Sakez, which showed truckloads of riot police moving throughout the city. While the demonstrations have focused on Amini's death, anger has been simmering in Iran for years over the country's cratering economy. Sanctions over Tehran's nuclear program have seen a collapse in the country's real currency, wiping out the savings of many. It remains unclear how many people have been killed or arrested so far in the protests, an Oslo-based group. Iran Human Rights estimates that at least 201 people have been killed. A court in military ruled Myanmar convicted the country's ousted leader Aung San Suu Kyi on two more corruption charges. The two three-year sentences handed down today will be served concurrently and may add to previous convictions that give her a 26-year prison term. Suu Kyi was detained in February 2021 when the military seized power from her elected government. She's denied the charges of receiving half a million dollars in bribes from a tycoon once convicted of drug trafficking. She'd already been sentenced to 23 years imprisonment after being convicted of several charges, including illegally importing and possessing walkie-talkies, violating coronavirus restrictions, and sedition. Meanwhile, Toyota Motor Corporation says it's begun assembling autos in Myanmar after more than a year-long delay following the military coup. Many foreign companies have withdrawn from Myanmar entirely. With the midterm elections just four weeks away, the race to control the United States Senate appears to be a toss-up. Mary Sherman filed this report. We might not get it. That wasn't the case a while ago, and I, I really do think it's a toss-up. Politico White House correspondent Anita Kumar echoed polling, showing with less than a month until Election Day, the battle to control the 50-50 Senate is at a stalemate. Each party currently has the lead in just one seat currently held by the opposition. The Republican is slightly ahead in Nevada, while the Democrat has the lead in Pennsylvania. In a key race to replace retiring Republican Ohio Senator Rob Portman, Entrepreneur and author J.D. Vance holds a slight edge over Democratic Congressman Tim Ryan. Tim Ryan represents a congressional district that has lost 50,000 jobs just in his time in office. Those of us who create jobs know what it's like when you have bad policies, and we know what it's like when you have good policies. During their Monday night debate, Ryan accused Vance of being an extremist. You're running around with Lindsey Graham, who wants a national abortion ban. You're running around with Marjorie Taylor Greene, who's the absolute looniest politician in America. This is a dangerous group. In the House, a Republican gain of 8 to 20 seats is predicted. Tulsi Gabbard, who ran for president in 2020 as a Democrat, is leaving the party. The former congresswoman called Democrats, quote, an elitist cabal of warmongers, 
that are radicalizing issues and stoking anti-white racism. I'm calling on my fellow common sense, independent-minded Democrats to join me in leaving the Democratic Party. If you can no longer stomach the direction that the so-called woke Democratic Party ideologues are taking our country, then I invite you to join me. Gabbard has been criticized by some Republicans for spreading Russian misinformation about U.S. biolabs in Ukraine. I'm Mary Sherman for Pacifica Network and Public News Service. The governor's race in the state of South Dakota is tightening up. Incumbent Republican Kristi Noem may struggle to keep her seat. Mike Moen reports. A new poll has some somewhat surprising findings surrounding that contest as voters consider the state's future. The South Dakota State University poll shows Republican incumbent Kristi Noem leading her Democratic challenger, State Senator Jamie Smith, by just four percentage points. SDSU political science professor Dave Wilty says it's noteworthy the race is this close, considering South Dakota is a deeply red state and Noem strongly embraces conservative ideals. But he doesn't predict a seismic shift based on these results. Even if they were to elect Jamie Smith to governor, that's really not going to change the trajectory of policy in this state. This fall, South Dakotans also will decide whether to expand Medicaid, an idea Nome opposes. Polls on that question have indicated bipartisan support for expansion, but Wiltsey doesn't really see any connection between that issue and voters' views about the current governor. He adds, Noam has a history of close elections and has always squeaked out a win. However, she's getting more unwanted attention this time, including an ethics matter over personal use of a state plane. The poll shows a larger number of Republicans among the state's undecided voters, and Wiltsey thinks they'll ultimately support Noam. He says it speaks to the high-level negative partisanship in politics today. That demonization of one's opponent, that just makes it all the harder for people to split their ticket. And he notes the poll shows the gender gap issue Republicans have encountered nationally has trickled down to state-level races. Noam has only 39 percent of support among women, but 52 percent of men said they backed the governor. Mike Moen, Greater Dakota News Service. The Indiana Supreme Court issued an order today that prevents the state from enforcing a Republican-backed abortion ban while it considers whether the ban violates the state constitution. The court said in the order that it was taking over appeals of a judge's decision last month that blocked the law a week after it took effect. It denied a request from the state attorney general's office to set aside the preliminary injunction and scheduled a hearing on the lawsuit filed by abortion clinic operators for January 12th. Owen County Judge Kelsey Hanlon blocked the law from becoming in force, writing that there is a reasonable likelihood that the significant restriction of personal autonomy offends the liberty guarantees of the Indiana Constitution and that the clinics will eventually prevail in the lawsuit. The ban was approved by the state's Republican-dominated legislature on August 5th and signed by Republican Governor Eric Holcomb. That made Indiana the first state to enact tighter abortion restrictions after the U.S. Supreme Court eliminated federal abortion protections by overturning Roe v. Wade in June. The five-member Supreme Court, all of whom were appointed by Republican governors, did not explain their decision. An eight-week abortion ban signed into law last month by West Virginia Governor Jim Justice has received widespread criticism for its lack of exceptions and severity of punishment for doctors who perform the medical procedure. Nadia Ramlagan has that story. Some in West Virginia are criticizing what they call a behind-closed-doors legislative process to pass the bill. Democratic State Senator Mike Caputo says the legislation was not vetted by any legislative committee and did not receive a single public hearing where physicians and other affected groups were asked to testify. You know, I'm a coal miner. I'm not a doctor. I want to hear from from OBGYNs. I want to hear from women. I want to hear their stories 
before I make a the decision like that. And I think that every legislator should have, have afforded the right to, to hear that. The bill also requires physicians to report the date of the abortion and the name of the performing physician to a legislative oversight committee. Republican lawmakers argue the legislation is a compromise and includes exceptions for cases of rape or incest, or in cases where the life of the pregnant person is in danger. But Caputo argues the exceptions in the abortion ban are smoke and mirrors. He believes the legislation imposes numerous extremely time-sensitive obstacles, including requiring adult survivors of sexual assault to report the assault to law enforcement at least 48 hours before an abortion that must be performed within the first eight weeks of pregnancy. Now, let's think about that. That's the most traumatic time uh, an individual would be going through. He says he wants residents to consider how the new law may affect them or their loved ones. He says voting is the only way to change what he sees as devastating legislation that will compromise the reproductive health of hundreds of thousands of West Virginia women. It's in the hands of the voting public, and they need to be educated of who those legislators were that uh, that, that took away their individual right to reproductive decisions. While the majority of Democratic voters in West Virginia consider themselves pro-choice and the majority of Republican voters consider themselves pro-life, fewer than one-fifth of Republicans have voiced support for a full abortion ban, according to a recent poll by the West Virginia Chamber of Commerce. This is Nadia Ramlagan for West Virginia News Service. And this is the Evening News on KPFA in Berkeley, KPFK in Los Angeles, KFCF in Fresno, and online at kpfa.org. This is Brian edwards Teekert. Every morning on Upfront, we give you a window into what's happening in your community and around the world. It's a mix of reporting, interviews, and debates where we ask hard questions and make room for thoughtful answers. From City Hall to Ukraine, pretty much everywhere in between. Start your morning with Upfront at 7 a.m. right after Democracy Now!, right here on KPFA. All of our thank you gifts for your donation to this listener-sponsored station are still available till the end of the week, even though our fund drive ended last Friday. Unfortunately, our fund drive fell significantly short of our goal Therefore, we're asking you to help make up as much as you can of the difference between what we need and what we got. So if you can go online and look around and see if there's any KPFA merchandise that appeals to you, our T-shirts, our socks, our hoodie sweatshirt, our baseball cap, some other pieces of swag and books and videos. And if you can make a contribution at kpfa.org online, that would be a great help. Or you can still call our operators at 1-800-439-5732. 1-800-439-5732. We're asking you to do what you can to minimize the impact that the shortfall here is going to have on the broadcast operations of KPFA. 1-800-439-5732 or online at kpfa.org. Meanwhile, if you're listening to this newscast in Southern California, the fun drive at KPFK, from which this newscast is emanating to your radio speaker right now, to your ears, is underway. It's in full flower The number to call there is 818-985-5735 and help KPFK avoid the fate of falling short of their financial goals. 818-985-5735 or online at kpfk.org. 1-800-439-5732 for Central and Northern California, but in Southern California, 818 985-5735-KPFK.org. A Los Angeles-based civil rights organization today highlighted the growing number of hate crimes in California and laid out a set of recommended solutions. Max Pringle reports. 
The Act Against Hate Alliance said education and community involvement are the keys to stopping the rise in hate crime incidents in the state, which the California Department of Justice has been tracking. Gloria Romero is the former majority leader of the California State Senate and a public policy professor at Pepperdine University. She said the pandemic increased hate crimes against the Asian and Pacific Islander communities. All of us have been horrified when we've seen images from New York to San Francisco and and, and, uh, in California, seeing especially women and especially Asian American women who have been beaten on the streets, uh, beaten in the subways, being shoved to uh, intended deaths. The Act Against Hate Alliance says hate crimes against Asians often go unreported because of language barriers in immigrant communities and fear of retaliation. Natalie Salazar is with Los Angeles Regional Crime Stoppers. It's an organization that provides people with a way of leaving anonymous tips for law enforcement, thereby, says Salazar, lessening some hate crime victims' reluctance to come forward. You know, we can't have public safety without public participation. So something like Crime Stoppers gives people an alternative, a way to do the right thing and report crime. The Act Against Hate Alliance also says early intervention during childhood can interrupt the cycle of mistrust and suspicion of other people by teaching kids about tolerance and inclusion. For KPFA News, I'm Max Pringle. Inflation at the wholesale level rose 8.5% in September from a year earlier. It's third straight decline, although it's still at a painfully high level. Today's report from the Labor Department also showed that the producer price index, which measures price changes before they reach the consumer, rose four-tenths of a percent in September from August after two months of declines. William Denisler reports. The producer price index ticked up 0.4% in September, exceeding the 0.2% rise many analysts had expected. This metric's a gauge on the price that companies in the U.S. get for the services and products they make. Inflation in the U.S. is currently up at around 40-year highs, with PPI now up 8.5% compared to a year ago. The Federal Reserve has raised interest rates five times already this year in a bid to curb price pressures. Analysts expect the Fed to again raise rates by 75 basis points at the central bank's next meeting in early November. The closely watched consumer price index is due out on Thursday. William Denslow, New York. Tens of millions of older Americans are about to get what may be the biggest raise of their lifetimes. Tomorrow, the U.S. government is set to announce what's virtually certain to be the largest increase in Social Security benefits in 40 years. The boost is meant to allow beneficiaries to keep up with inflation. How it's generated stirs plenty of controversy. Critics say the data used to set the cost of living increase doesn't reflect what older Americans are actually spending. It's also a one-size-fits-all increase, which means beneficiaries get the same amount of a raise regardless of where they live or how big of a nest egg they've got squirreled away. Gig workers were to rally in San Francisco at Uber headquarters with a march to Lyft today to announce the formation of a statewide union for gig drivers and delivery workers, dubbed the California Gig Workers Union. Organizers of the union say it will help gig workers have a stronger voice to negotiate fair wages, health benefits, and worker protections. It comes a day after the Biden administration announced a new proposal on how workers should be classified, saying that thousands of people have been incorrectly labeled as contractors rather than employees, potentially curtailing access to benefits and protections they rightfully deserve. The department said that misclassifying workers as independent contractors denies those employees protections under federal labor standards, promotes wage theft, allows certain employers to gain an unfair market advantage over business competitors, and hurts the economy as a whole. A statement from Gig Workers Rising hailed the Biden administration's move and said gig workers deserve all of the rights that other employees have, including the right to organize. 
California is home to 30% of the nation's homeless population. That's according to this year's point-in-time count, so says Margot Kuschel, a professor of the University of San Francisco, who testified today at a state assembly hearing on homelessness in San Francisco. Nearly 30 percent of all people experiencing homelessness nationwide live here in California. And according to our last complete count, the 2022 data are just coming out, there were about 160,000 people experiencing homelessness on a single night. Black and indigenous uh, individuals are overrepresented dramatically, where black individuals constitute just 5% of the state's overall population. They represent 30% of those who are homeless. And indigenous Californians comprise 1.6%, but nearly 4% of the homeless population. Professor Kuschel says the state has a housing shortage of 1 million affordable homes for extremely low-income households to help prevent that number from increasing even further, noting the extremely low-income homes are spending more than half of their salary on rent. California, currently, we have 23 units of housing that's affordable and available for every 100 extremely low-income households. And we unfortunately have the second worst record in the nation. As a result, nearly three of four extremely low income households in California are severely cost burdened, meaning they spend more than half of their income on housing costs and utilities. This leaves these households without a personal safety net if unexpected expected expenses or events. And in California, due to the ongoing impacts of structural racism, black and Latinx renters are more likely than white renters to be extremely low income to be extremely cost burdened, and to be homeless. Housing advocates are urging an increase in homeless funding for programs like Project Home Key, which incentivizes local jurisdictions to provide housing. Professor Kuschel said the project showed local jurisdictions could provide affordable housing at an affordable cost to them through the project and urged continued funding for the program. Students at San Jose State University were to rally today against the university's mishandling of sexual assault claims on campus. Specifically, the group's Students Against Sexual Assault claim the campus has failed to adequately respond to sexual abuse claims by student athletes for years. They're calling for the termination of its Title IX officer for full staffing at the Title IX office and the university to release an investigation into the office. This comes after the FBI filed charges earlier this year against the former athletic trainer at San Jose State for sexual misconduct against nearly two dozen female athletes over the course of a near 15-year tenure at the school. Students also filed a lawsuit against the university claiming the campus failed to act. Richmond School District, the West Contra Costa Unified School District, faces receivership. That's according to a letter from the Contra Costa County Office of Education. It's warning the school district is no longer able to meet its financial obligations with a multi-year structural deficit of $46.5 million. The county said it's already stepped in by giving power to a financial advisor who can rescind any decision that the district makes at sites declining enrollment without reduced staffing to match the reduced enrollment dollars that have come in. A receivership forces school boards to lose control of the district and appoints officials to lead the district instead. Clouds tomorrow morning around the San Francisco Bay Area, clearing by the afternoon, a high of 60 degrees tomorrow around the Bay. Inland, partly cloudy skies with highs in the low 80s in the central San Joaquin Valley tomorrow. Sunny with a high of 90 degrees in Los Angeles tomorrow. Clouds in the morning, sun in the afternoon, highs in the mid-70s. That's it for the news tonight for this Wednesday, October 12th. I'm Mark Miracle. Good evening. KPFA is now live streaming news headlines online. Just in case you can't listen to the radio, tune into our Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube for news headlines. 
That's at KPFA 94.1 on Facebook and at KPFA Radio on Twitter and YouTube. You're listening to 94.1 KPFA, 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, KFCF, 88.1 FM in Fresno, 97.5 K248BR in Santa Cruz, and online worldwide, worldwide, worldwide at kpfa.org. Mm-hmm.